Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Hajj Day Today. This is another live edition. We're continuing to cover uh, the Hajj pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia. We're also providing you from here uh, relevant and updated uh, news and information from around the Muslim world about Hajj. We also have in the studios with us uh, in-depth discussions related to various Hajj topics. Uh, tonight we will continue providing news and information about uh, the movement of Muslims, they're still in some places still making their way to Saudi Arabia. In particular tonight, we're going to focus on a special group of uh, Muslims from Iraq. They have been smuggled out uh, through uh, a very arduous path uh, under the cover of dark and other hardships they had to face. Under, they're coming from areas in Iraq that are under the control of the Islamic State. We're very happy to have these Iraqi pilgrims join us. We're going to take a deep, closer look at their story uh, later. Uh, in the program. Also, we have uh, some statements here. There's a speech that's been made by Iran's Ayatollah. He has uh, on some uh, very strong words against colonialists and Western powers, but he's saying that Hajj is particularly important for uh, promoting Muslim solidarity. A very important message from the Ayatollah in Iran. Uh, then also, we have a very interesting story from North America in the United States. I, uh, Footballer, a Muslim footballer who plays in the NFL, uh, there was an announcement related to him. He scored uh, a touchdown, a goal for his team, and in the end zone, he uh, made, he assumed, or the sajood position, which is the position of worshiping Allah. Uh, he was uh, penalized, but we'll see a recent ruling by the authority for uh, the governing body of this organization, uh, what they have to say about this Muslim player uh, in the United States. We have a few other items for you as well for our news. Uh, following news tonight for our social segment, uh, as always, we're going to touch on some health topics. And of course, we're going to talk tonight about how uh, the, some of the health aspects related to Hajj. All of us are not always c uh, coming to Hajj in the same states of health. Also, in addition to this, uh, we are still experiencing warm weather. We're starting to see the beginning of autumn, but it's still warm. Uh, this makes uh, the Hajj something important to talk about. We're going to be looking for our social segment tonight, uh, some of the health aspects of the Hajj. And then also we're going to be talking about Hajj as a way of answering the call of Allah. We will take a short break right now and come back with the news. Salaamu Alaikum. Imagine that the NBA, they were the ones, they were the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they had the hardest lives. He assumed that he had some kind of superiority and he was a better, more chosen, you know, a select, better person because he had this wealth. And then you look at all the other people who had wealth and some of them were the worst people. He had Fir'aun, Fir'aun and Qarun. Ka reviving your niya time and again, time and again, uh, that you're doing insincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of the youth, they think, oh, I'm going to pray when I'm old. It's okay now, I'll have fun, have fun in my life. Later on, I'll work. I'll go in my bed, I'll pray five times a day. And all these things, they think that that's later on in their life and they don't know when, when. When they will die. I mean, who's your role model? Khadija radiallahu And why? Because she was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wife, and she was the first lady to believe in Islam. <laughs> Huda TV's social media sites are the best way to contact us from anywhere around the world. 
Stay connected with Huda TV's latest news and programs through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Skype, and Instagram. It's fast and easy. Stay up to date with your favorite shows and scholars today. Huda TV, a light in every home. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لا شريك لك إن الحمد والنعمت لك Why is Hajj so important? Allah the Almighty said in verse number 97 of uh, the third chapter of the Quran which is known as Ali Imran He said ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا تابعوا بين الحج والعمرة فإنهما ينفيان الفقر والذنوب follow up mm-hmm. performing hajj yes. after hajj and umrah after umrah so what is the first step ihram the first pillar is ihram mm-hmm. what is ihram and what does it entail hajj al ifrad many of the local people do hajj al ifrad and others because they're exempt from offering the hajj or the sacrifice it doesn't require Hajj. So when you say لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً وَحَجَّ That's called Qiran. And you do the rites of Umrah and you do not take off the Ihram condition. Rather you continue until you finish the Hajj. So Al-Hajj and Al-Umrah and following up uh, between Hajj and Umrah for those who can afford it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their past sins or whatever sins in, in between. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك السلام عليكم welcome back to Hajj Day Today for our first item this evening we will go to Saudi Arabia and look at uh, the latest in the tent city of Minna, the Saudi agency, agencies have said that they've completed all of their preparations at the tent city and they're ready to receive this year's more than two million Hajj pilgrims. Uh, the, also, the missions uh, from the various countries that are serving their uh, fellow countrymen for the Hajj, they have finalized all of the training uh, in preparation for serving the Hajjs, uh, and uh, there are, again, uh, just as uh, much as the Saudi agencies are ready, these Hajj agencies are also, uh, uh, mission agencies are also ready. On Wednesday, after the nighttime Aisha prayer, uh, pilgrims, who are staying in and around Mecca, they've started migrating into uh, the Mena Valley. Some were coming on foot, others by bus. They will continue uh, making their way into Mena uh, through uh, Thursday. Uh, then, of course, on Friday, the big day, when all of the two, more than two million Muslims will be on the plains of Arafat. Uh, this, uh, the Hajj missions, uh, have uh, all, uh, also very carefully prepared and designed these Hajj operation plans. Uh, they're designed to make the movement of their pilgrims uh, very smoothly uh, without uh, any, any hiccups or uh, disturbances. Inshallah, they can complete their Hajj with the support that they're getting. There's lots of support by the government and f- by the country's Hajj missions. Uh, uh, we will take a closer look at one particular mission. This is the Pakistani uh, mission. Uh, the consulate in Jeddah, they announced that they have completed the training uh, course that it had conducted for its members of the Pakistani Hajj Volunteers Group. This, again, is one of the spe- uh, particular uh, Hajj uh, missions by, again, Pakistan. They did this in partnership with the uh, World Assembly of Muslim Youth. Uh, the main coordinator for the Pakistani group, uh, Professor Wassam Bukhari, he described the group saying that it is comprised entirely of volunteers who have come from a variety of professions and backgrounds. He said that the 3,000 volunteers, they came together for the sole purpose of helping Hodges during the pilgrimage. Uh, Mohammed Nawaz, the group's senior fang, uh, founding member, he said that the group volunteers will also uh, help uh, of course, other Hajjis from other nationalities. One of the reasons that there, um, if you could, I'm sure we can imagine, uh, there are certain uh, um, language barriers, and so uh, this is why it's important, uh, why many countries send their own Hajj missions to help support the country 
uh, the, the people coming from their countries, uh, as well as some cultural barriers that may be uh, in place. And again, all of this is to help make the Hajj more easy and comfortable for the pilgrims. Uh, for our next story, uh, we will go to Iraq. This is a very a special story. Uh, the head of Iraq's Hajj delegation, as well as the Iraqi undersecretary for Hajj, uh, they have confirmed that they've successfully smuggled out 8,000 Iraqis that were living under the control in areas that are under the control of the Islamic State so that they can come to Saudi Arabia to perform the Hajj. Iraqi Hajj officials, they said that the pilgrims were actually putting their lives on the line by escaping to perform the Hajj. Officials, they also said that the pilgrims had to move under the cover of darkness through the Euphrates River, uh, through remote areas uh, to secret rendezvous locations to meet military planes that airlifted them safely out of the country. An important part of their success in this operation uh, was the support of the Kurdish authorities. While the uh, uh, former Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki was in power, the Sunni population in Iraq, uh, in Mosul, they were banned from performing Hajj for a period of time. Uh, this year there are nearly 27,000 Iraqi pilgrims uh, performing Hajj this year. Uh, so again, this is, this is uh, a very, very special story. We're glad to see uh, these brothers and sisters making it. Again, the number 27,000 Iraqis uh, from ir uh, performing Hajj this year. Uh, there's another group of, uh, a very small group of students uh, from the island nation of Maldives. This is about 600 kilometers off the coast of uh, India. They were uh, detained by the Saudi police. Uh, eventually, they were uh, rejected from entering Mecca. Uh, this is a small group of students. Uh, they were traveling to Mecca, they said, to assist uh, their fellow uh, countrymen who were there to perform the Hajj. This year, we saw about 1,000 Maldavians uh, going to Saudi Arabia for Hajj. Uh, this group of 10 students, they arrived in Mecca on Tuesday, uh, and they were detained again by the Saudi police at a checkpoint and sent back to Medina. The head of the Maldavian uh, Hajj mission in Mecca said that the students, quote, had the documents to enter Mecca, but the police at the checkpoint said that the documents were counterfeit. The student uh, told the Saudi authorities that they paid $400 to receive the permits for Hajj uh, to an agent in Medina. The students had also taken uh, the, uh, the uh, capital to Riyadh and released, uh, they were released uh, at about four, just before 5 a.m. on uh, Wednesday. Now, this is not especially unique because they were turned away. We've seen the Saudi authorities turn away uh, many thousands. In, in fact, uh, last week we saw uh, the number was one, nearly 100,000 people had been turned back and not permitted to enter for Hajj. There's nothing special in that regard, but what this shows is that uh, even in Saudi Arabia, in Medina, uh, there's uh, an effort to swindle people out of their money uh, for this very sacred right that we have. A and also it shows the vigilance of the Saudi authorities to stop uh, the uh, illegal act uh, uh, actions of those who are seeking to exploit uh, very honest, uh, uh, God-fearing um, uh, Muslims who want to participate or, in their case, support those who are performing Hajj. We'll go to this statement or this speech that was made by the Ayatollah in Iran for our next story. Uh, he was uh, at a meeting with uh, some of Iran's Hajj officials. Uh, they were discussing Muslim unity. Uh, the Ayatollah, he said uh, today, quote, one of the most important uh, methods that the enemies of the Islamic uh, Ummah, the Muslim world, uh, uh, use is creating discord. He said that the enemies of Islam, they create discord. Uh, if some, uh, someone accepts, he said, that the Islamic movement and the Islamic awakening threatens the interests of the great powers, uh, they can naturally understand that these great powers focus on all of their efforts to create discord am among Muslims, keeping them busy with trivial things, pitting them against one another, he said, and preventing them from thinking. He continued talking about these uh, great powers, uh, a very vague term. Uh, he said that they provoke 
the elements of discord between Islamic denominations. He's referring to Shia and Sunni. Uh, and that this is what the hands of the colonialists are doing at the present time. Unfortunately, he said some of the people uh, are, that are being used by them are Muslims on both sides, Sunni and Shiites. Uh, during the Hajj pilgrimage, he said, you should do your best to decrease the lack of understanding among one another and uh, see through all these fake grudges, quote unquote. Uh, again, this is the Ayatollah continuing to speak, saying that Muslim solidarity, we should not fall prey to what he says is the takfira, takfidi, uh, the schemes of the enemies of Islam. For our next story, we go to Dubai. A prison authorities there are uh, helping uh, poor families by giving them money to purchase meat for the sacrifice. Uh, poor families uh, of inmates who are still in detention, uh, they uh, uh, are receiving uh, financial support uh, to buy the sacrificial meat again for the Eid al-Adha uh, holiday. Uh, the initiative was a part of a police effort to support poor families of inmates in cooperation with charity associations and philanthropists. Uh, the inmates' families were welcomed by the acting director of uh, the, uh, the corrections facility and gave them Eid greetings and uh, as well as the uh, assistance to buy the uh, sacrificial animals to participate in uh, this very important uh, uh, festival. So we're glad to see this act of charity. Uh, and this is not the only one we've been seeing all many types of uh, forms of charity. Uh, the next story is yet another form of charity in the Emirates. We'll stay in the Emirates for our next story. Uh, some of the rulers in the Emirates uh, have released groups of prisoners so that they can go home and join their families for the Eid holiday. Uh, uh, Ajman, uh, he's one of the rulers. He released nearly 70 prisoners, that's 68 pri prisoners, from uh, the uh, uh, punitive uh, centers that they were being held at. Also, uh, Sheikh Hamid bin Rashid al uh, Nuami, he's a Supreme Council member. He ordered uh, these 68 prisoners uh, to be released uh, for what he said was their good behavior, uh, for, again, so that they can be home with their families for the Eid holiday. Uh, they were pardoned, uh, and he said that this demonstrates the kindness uh, of uh, the uh, rulers uh, in the Emirates. This is a very similar thing that we saw during the other Eid, the second official um, Islamic holiday, Eid al-Fitr, where uh, a very similar thing, there were lots of uh, prisoners being released so that they can celebrate with their families. Uh, for our next story, we go to the United States. There's a group of Muslims at... Uh, one of the universities there, they have a, an Eid al-Adha event that they have uh, uh, launched on their campus. This is uh, in the, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. state of Pennsylvania. This is the Penn Muslim Student Association. Uh, they want to celebrate the Eid uh, by inviting members from not only the Muslim uh, community but the wider uh, non-Muslim uh, part of the society. Uh, in the United States, there are between three to six uh, million Muslims who celebrate uh, the Eid holiday every year. Uh, so we're very glad to see this young group of Muslims in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the uh, University of Pennsylvania, one of the uh, more prestigious universities in the United States, uh, celebrating Eid in, in a public forum uh, so that they can uh, help uh, is a form of dawah actually, help other pe non-Muslims learn about Islam and uh, give a venue uh, for Muslims to uh, celebrate in solidarity. Uh, for our last story this evening, for our news, we stay in the United States and look at a recent announcement ma made by uh, the, the league that governs the American football. Uh, it's the NFL. Uh, they said on Tuesday that this footballer, Hussein Abdullah, uh, he should not have been penalized in the game uh, for what he was uh, called unsportsmanlike conduct when he formed the sujood position on his knees after uh, scoring a goal for his team. Uh, the league, uh, the rule books for the league say that uh, it prohibits players from celebrating while on the ground. Uh, the officiating uh, mechanic or the referee at the game 
in this situation should not have flagged the player uh, who, because he went to the ground, the, the uh, rules allow the religious expression uh, in these situations. Uh, the, the official there, uh, 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 in other words, gave him uh, a ruling that was not valid according to the officials at the NFL. Uh, the flag was thrown in the fourth quarter. At this particular game, they won by a score of 41 to 14, a very significant victory for the Kansas City Chiefs. This is the name of the team that Hussein Abdullah played for uh, in the United States. And uh, we see many Christian players, this is a very common thing, when they score these goals, uh, they will go down on one knee and cross themselves, uh, and there's no problem with that. And so perhaps because uh, this will be awakening, an awakening for the officials and for the league itself, uh, to recognize that the, when Muslims do this, uh, it's no different than when than Christians do it, and they should not be penalized for it. And alhamdulillah, they did win the game, and in the future, uh, uh, also, this brother, he took off a year uh, prior to this uh, just, just for the purpose of performing the Hajj. Obviously, it wasn't this year. Uh, the report doesn't say if it was last year, but recently, in recent years, he took an entire uh, year off. This is, no big this is no small thing. It's big to take a year off of your professional uh, career, and he did this solely for the purpose of performing Hajj. Uh, alhamdulillah, we, we appreciate his leadership and hope that the, the league can change in the direction that favors the Muslim players. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to uh, the uh, news segment of the program. We will continue Hajj day to day. Brother Osama El Shami, he is here to host uh, the social segment tonight. Uh, the focus is answering the call of Allah. Uh, Hajj is a, one of the basic pillars of Islam. We're going to be talking about that as well as the uh, the health or the medical aspect of performing the Hajj. We hope you enjoy a very informative program. Inshallah, we'll be back with you uh, tomorrow with more. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La bayk Allahumma la bayk La bayk Allahumma la bayk La bayk la sharika laka la bayk La bayk la sharika laka la bayk Wa ni'amata Laka And the Kalbiya, as we all know, is when a Muslim would say La bayk Allahumma la bayk La bayk la sharika laka la bayk Inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka wal mulk La sharika laka You should not say that Every Muslim should perform Hajj. And when we are performing the Hajj, we need to reach this perfection by seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, by seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and we do not know what is good for us. The Kaaba is not the bricks that is being built. The Kaaba is what is behind or what's behind the meanings of Al Kaaba, the first house of worship. If a person would know the wisdom behind every move that a person do in matters of worship, then where's the submission comes into the full meanings of it. To remember what Hajar, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when she went from the Safa to the Marwa, so concerned and disturbed about the affairs of her child Ismail, when he was laying some, time, some place between the Safa and the Marwa, crying because of the shortage of food and water. Your questions and comments mean a lot to Huda TV crew, so please don't hesitate to contact us on social media. On Facebook, www.facebook.com slash huda.tv on YouTube, www.youtube.com slash Huda TV. On Twitter, at Huda TV Channel. On our official website, www.
www.huda.tv. You can watch Huda TV on the Nilesat on the following parameters. Frequency 11747. Huda TV is also now available for broadcast on the Galaxy 19 satellite in the United States of America on the following parameters. Satellite Galaxy 19, frequency 12184. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear brothers and sisters to this very very special episode of Hajj Day Today and it's very special because technically speaking Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alameen Hajj has begun and our brothers and sisters have made their way to Mina. Tomorrow of course is the very big day because everyone will be going to Arafah inshaAllah and inshaAllah we will be bringing you that live right here on Huda TV throughout the entire day we'll be with you live for more than 12 maybe 15 hours tomorrow inshaAllah as we bring you live coverage from Arafat inshaAllah on this beautiful day of Arafah tomorrow now as we think of Hajj my dear brothers and sisters something has to come to our mind something so special about why we're doing what we're doing why are all of these people mashallah walking these long distances and you know getting in crowded situations and spending all this money and making all this effort and leaving their businesses behind and every other thing that you can imagine why are they doing all of this if it is not for a special cause for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really in order for them to follow the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We perform Hajj, my dear brothers and sisters, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do so. He ordered us to perform Hajj. So tonight, inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, we're going to be talking about this very, very special subject of how we can answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only in Hajj, but in life in general. And I'm really honored to be joined here in the studio by Brother Yusuf Salhi. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for being with it's us here this evening. Always. And it's always a pleasure to uh, uh, have you with us, inshallah. It's always mine. Jazakallah um, khairan. When we think about answering a call, right? We all get calls on our, on our phones on a daily basis. And uh, we either, you know, uh, want to answer these calls or we don't. Sometimes we act like we're not hearing the phone. Um, are we doing that similarly when it comes, of course, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثُلُ الْأَعْلَى to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs to the highest of examples. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to do something, are we sometimes following that command and other times we're not? Yes, unfortunately, sometimes we, we don't follow, we don't answer the commands. But let me start with the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَجِيبُوا لِلَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُحِيكُمْ O you who believe, answer the call of Allah and His Prophet when they ask you or they call you for what makes you alive. So it's, there's always a call. There's always a call for, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all Muslims and believers at all times. It's not even in Hajj only. It, we have it. This call is in Quran for 90 times. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe. It's 90 times in Quran. It's five time a days of Adhan every day. It's, this is the call of, call of Allah. And it's in dozens of examples within the prophetic uh, sunnah. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, I descend on the last third of every night saying, O oh, you who pray, does, does it, there's anyone who prays and want me to answer uh, their prayer? Is there anyone who's asking or seeking forgiveness so I forgive them? It's always in every uh, like walk of life we find the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mm. live our life and submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fully. Zakallah khayn. Barakallah feek. Now, of course, the next question that comes to someone's mind is how do I do that? How do I know that I'm a person who answers the call uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's a good question. It's not only about answering or submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. We can measure our iman, uh, uh, whether it's weak or strong, through the, the quick of the response. 
mm. so I can see if I really have a quick response uh, to calls of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the prayers to Hajj because for many if we're speaking now about Hajj and I'm very touched on <laughs> my heart is beating for the Arafah and even for the background it is not only Muslims who sometimes not very like interested in Hajj they, they might be interested about traveling abroad studying abroad going for tourism mm -hmm. and like sightseeing and stuff but when it comes to Hajj we're sometimes we're a little bit lazy but alhamdulillah when we see those millions of Muslims answering the call of Allah we know that there is a hope that this quick answer this quick response would reflect on their like actual life when they get back from Hajj to have quick responses al also to the rest of their lives I really like the, the point that you said uh, about uh, subhanAllah being quick to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes. to his call because uh, it's kind of like uh, going back to the phone situation you know if you're waiting for, for, for someone call. to call you you'll, you'll answer it right away you yeah. might even find yourself automatically uh, answering it yeah, sure. but uh, you know if you just keep waiting and waiting maybe you're you know procrastinating and delaying and then who knows maybe eventually you'll miss out on the call yes it, it happens many times when like somebody's waiting for like a close friend or a lover it's like in in our language is very youth language and I answer all of a sudden just before the the phone rings mm. and they t tell me are you sitting on the bottom of the <laughs> cell phone or, or what yeah. so w that's what happened it's even calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not only a call from Allah to, to us we have we we have to call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have the ayah and the, the verse from the Quran it's it's always well known that this special ayah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removing all medities between Allah and his slaves and his servants mm -hmm. so it's f f to and fro up and down uh, going from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descending to us calls and then we have to call and pray for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at response now uh, let's relate to what we're talking about specifically to Hajj um, what is the wisdom uh, behind Hajj and how is it a form of answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course the wisdom behind Hajj would take like <laughs> hours and it's not, I don't think I'm someone who uh, authentic to call to speak on it but in in my point of view this is very modest I think it is living the experience that the living experience of the journey of faith of the first few believers we have Ibrahim alayhi salam involved his story involved in Hajj Hajar alayhi salam Ismail alayhi salam and then it comes Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam performing and acting for us these very very steps of the the believers who started believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Ibrahim the father of prophets so it's always w when we say uh, living the experience is different from speaking about about it so living the experience of faith mm. and the very beginning of faith is different from speaking about faith so when a, when a Muslim goes to Hajj performs what Hajar salam has been doing performs what Ibrahim salam has been doing uh, had done uh, during his journey of faith and the struggle with shaitan so it, it exemplifies lo like our love as our lives as Muslims we're struggling with shaitan we seek faith and we seek to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better mm -hmm. and to, to be closer to, us, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep worships and rites uh, perfectly so if we can apply the example of Hajj in our lives it would be a perfect example of, of living our lives as this experience of Hajj How does the call of Hajj shape um, the world in terms of equality and justice? In Hajj we find we, we watch them the, I watch the TV and I don't see anything other than we can see hairs for like black and then white these I can differentiate between a man and a woman and a black and a white a tall and short uh, like a, someone who has like a bodybuilding or, <laughs> or muscles mm -hmm. or slim people like me it's we're all the same and I can see a scenery in 
even in movies and the very highest technology and tools uh, portraying equality and that we are all one humankind other than Hajj. And the miracle that this is real. Even in movies, the, which is fake, it's like it's done, it's, it's made up. Uh, they can do something like this. But this is in Islam and this is in Hajj. It's so real. Uh, you watch it and you, you, don't, you can't even differentiate who are those. Are those Africans? Asians or Europeans are those uh, rich people mm -hmm. are those poor people uh, you never know There's, you can know one thing they're all people they're all humankind and they're all Muslims and this is the greatness of Islam this scene is never found in any other place in any other faith with all respect but this is only found in Islam. And this is remind us of the day of judgment. We will all be like this. All humankind, either Muslims or non-Muslims. Now, I want to take you uh, to kind of uh, a question about why. You know, why do we answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do so? I think if I would say from my perspective, if I want to live my my life ideally uh, from other than being uh, a good Muslim it is I think it's even maybe from a logical point of view for a believer since I believe there is a, a God there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is consequently a Sharia and a faith that he and a guide that he has given us to follow so if I want my life perfect live my life perfectly and I have an ideal life and this consequently would give me a hint for the afterlife. This is the way. The way is to answer this guide, is to follow the guide and the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, and I think this is the easiest way to live a happy life in the worldly life and in the afterlife. Zakullah hmm. um, Obviously, on this uh, way to answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muslims may face some obstacles. It's not always an easy uh, path. So uh, what are some obstacles that we uh, might, might uh, pass through and how can we overcome them? I think mainly there are two obstacles and barriers. There is ourselves and whether you can call it a nafs and the shaitan or mm -hmm. satan. Mm -hmm. They're the two main obstacles. And I think if we watch Ramadan, for instance, uh, we know that the marad al shayateen are like tied they're not allowed, but we still can find Muslims sin. I myself maybe doing this. So why? Because this is the other obstacle, which is a nafs. We have three kinds of three types of a nafs. The nafs that's calling the, the the Muslim to do good because he has been rising his his nafs to be uh, ob obedient to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and there is. And nafs al amara bisu, which is like always cause you for, for evil, which is the opposite of the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always for goodness, whether for yourself, for others, for the humanity, for, for worship, it's always call of goodness. So I think there's the two main obstacles, this shaitan and ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we can handle both of them by trying our best to answer the call of Allah, being a way of all kinds of evil, all things that drags us uh, down from answering the call of Allah. How can we apply in our daily lives, um, you know, lessons that are step by step that we can learn from Hajj? Yeah, there are uncountable lessons from Hajj. And I can't, like, even spot all of them. But I think... Uh, I can spot from my point of view as, as a young man, maybe, that there is always we have to link, like a full link between our lives and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've been uh, saying about the ideal way of life, is just to have this link, whatever you do, even playing. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to say, even when you rest, even when you play,
when you have this intention, and this intention is a, is a, is a heart link between what you're doing and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His commandments, and you're saying to, yourselves, to yourself, I'm going to rest because I want to have more time to work and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And always, also at Hajj, is this is to remember that you have to take a whole part of your life only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it happens sometimes. And it, it's not only for those who, goes to, who go to Hajj. It's also, also for us, who, those who didn't have the chance to go to Hajj. Maybe um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all to go to his house. Mm -hmm. But also the first 10 days of, uh, of the Hijjah is an offer for all Muslims. And I would, I, would like, I would love to spot this. We also, in a time that uh, always were people crazy about offers, about sale, about purchasing, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and whatever, whatever there is an offer, there is a sale, we all run and like, yes, I want to get from this. Mm -hmm. And if we think of this in terms of Islam and in terms of cause of Allah, we have dozens and hundreds of offers throughout the Islamic calendar. Those 10 days uh, are, are meant to be the best 10 days in, in the Islamic calendar. And inshallah tomorrow is meant to be the best day that the sun rises on, on the Islamic calendar. We have Ramadan. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that I descend every night for, for those who ask for forgiveness. We have the, the, the call of repentance that is continuous throughout the Muslim life. From, he, from the time he's born to the time of death. It is all, it's always open. Whenever you want to repent, there is, no a specific, there is no specific time for repentance. Whenever you want to repent and you're alive, it's open. So these offers are always open for Muslims. Uh, the, the, the offers of fasting, the offers of praying, the offers mm -hmm. all kinds and acts of worship. There are dozens of offers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a beauty and more uh, merits and hasanat of doing uh, such things. Uh, and there's always, we can find uh, the Prophet وسلم وسلم. saying that, and in Quran, that one hasana is counted as 10, and it's sometimes multiple to 700. And a hadith saying that if you pray Isha on time and Fajr on time, you are considered praying the whole night. And we, we find uh, praying uh, Doha prayers uh, as the, like giving out lots of charity mm -hmm. and it is the charity for Muslims life and we find uh, praying 12 uh, raka'ah a day is building a palace on Jannah there are hundreds of offers there are hundreds of calls these offers are actually calls and it is multiple it has lots of advantages mm -hmm. and it's not only just pray no it's, on, it's always pray and you have multiple merits and multiple hasanat. Yes. Like, I can't imagine how much we have those beautiful offers and calls from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we are sometimes lazy to answer. We might answer shops and malls uh, better. Hmm. Now, when we think uh, about tomorrow, inshallah, we want to remind yeah. our brothers and sisters of uh, the importance of fasting tomorrow and answering yeah. uh, the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tomorrow, what would you say to our brothers and sisters? I would say I am very excited. That's what I, I want to say because uh, personally, I as someone, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. I, I, as anybody, I sin, I see myself as not the perfect uh, uh, worshiper and s s servant of Allah subhanahu wa mm -hmm. ta'ala. And I'm excited because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said that fasting on this day would remove and delete sins for two years, a year after and a year before. I can't imagine how much I would appreciate this day. Hmm. Uh, I am trying to prepare myself, uh, whether physically, if I want to fast, and we, we might eat suhoor, inshallah, and intentionally and preparing my schedule for the day. It is, it is in Islam, and I... I I think this is so great and so important that one day in the Islamic calendar, in the whole year, is the best day 
how should we act on this day? Mm -hmm. How should we take care of every single moment and second that passes? We don't want to. We don't want to pass uh, without worship, without dhikr, without ibadah, without reciting Quran, uh, without prayers, and it's also perfect because it's coming on Friday, and mm -hmm. I. This is like all the best things all together on one day. Mm -hmm. It's Friday, it's the best day on the Islamic calendar, and it forgives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day if it's accepted. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. If it's accepted, it wipes the sins of whole two years, and I'm, I, I'm very excited for my last year and my, my next year to be like pure years of my life. Yeah. And I think this is, I'm excited for not only for myself, for, for also for my brothers and sisters and all Muslims. I mean, Zakhul Khair. Now, uh, tell me about how different is Hajj in terms of being a call than other calls that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has commanded us with. What makes Hajj such a special call in itself? Of course, uh, in the very beginning, it's one of the Islamic, like the most uh, important actions in the Islamic uh, <coughs> faith. Mm -hmm. It's one pillar of Islam one duty uh, if people are able to do it and also we can find the beauty of Islam asking people who can do it and who are, who are capable uh, whether physically <coughs> in terms of health sorry and financially to go to Hajj and perform it and then it comes in the ayah it is the as some people and some uh, Muslim sheikh, uh, sheikhs describe it. It is the biggest conference of humanity in the whole world, mm -hmm. where all people are saying one call, are answering one call of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, saying "Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, we sub we totally submit ourselves to you. We hear on on Mecca and on places of Hajj, we're doing nothing other than answering your call. Mm -hmm. people traveling from the whole countries of the whole world like nation like nation nation wide all nations all tribes all people all types of people are there to do one thing to answer the call of Allah for us or for other for other calls it might be kind of short calls so you do it and maybe you is sometimes busy after or just you're not aware of what you're doing so maybe you pray and you're not really aware of praying. Of course, this is against khushu' but but sometimes it happens. But when you go to Hajj, you have nothing in mind. You're not caring about your career, your job. Uh, you're off everything in life. You kind of leave everything behind for a little while. Yes. So this is the difference uh, of the call of Hajj and everything else. And this is why I think Allah Subhanahu wa Taala have promised. All those who have performed Hajj and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepted it, where they go back home, pure as the day they were born in, mm. without like Any pure sense. from sins, yeah. but not pure from hasanat. So they have all the hasanat uh, as they live the whole life, mm -hmm. like worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and they pure as the day they they were born in. Inshallah. Inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to give us that opportunity yes. uh, soon, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to Hajj with you. I mean, that would be amazing. Wallah, I was just about to tell you that. Zakallah khair. Um, uh, SubhanAllah, when people are at Hajj, every single act that they're doing reflects this idea that they are trying their best to answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Truly. Uh, yes. Tell me about the importance of time when it comes to answering the call of Allah, when it comes to Hajj. For example, you know, for example, if you if you go to Arafah, uh, you know, on another day, just because it's going to be empty. Sorry, that's. <laughs> why, why don't you just go like on the first day of Eid, for example, <laughs> right? It'll, it'll be a whole lot more empty, yeah. and there won't be, be that many people. So, uh, your thoughts about the importance of of answering the call of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala at Hajj, uh, you know, on specific times, like for example, tomorrow, of course, sure. at, uh, at at Arafah, and you have to be within. You know, Arafah. A few hours. Uh, yeah, and, and at the same time, uh, not and not answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other things in our life. True. I, I want to render and reflect this even before going to Hajj on our daily and our normal lives. Mm -hmm. Islam teaches us 
to be uh, people who are on time, uh, like people are like conscientious uh, on their punctual on their timing. It's not only we can find these those teachings in prayers of five times and the best people who best Muslims who are following prayers or following on time on Hajj. It's all always within a specific time. Mm -hmm. Whether even Sunnah prayers, it's always within a specific time. So when it comes to Hajj, and why this specific timing, and why it is so specified, this is to tell Muslims that when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala calls you, you have, as we mentioned in the ver very beginning, mm -hmm. to have this quick response. And when it is very oblig obligated and obligatory in one specific time, we find all Muslims like answering the call all together. So it's not haphazardly. Mm -hmm. The process is not uh, whenever you want to do it. No. It teaches you and it trains you as a human being. When there is a call of Allah, you have to respond in time, if not on time. Mm -hmm. So when you miss the day of Arafah, we're sorry, you missed Hajj. Mm. Uh, and also we can you can find this throughout the rites of Hajj. Uh, right. When a Muslim Miss misses something from rights of al-hajj mm -hmm. uh, they have to uh, make up or they have to um, to fast even sometimes they have to um, slaughter the sheep there's some specific um, like response if you don't do it on time and you missed something you have to make up uh, and these things sometimes are financially because you know as human beings uh, money is the maybe the best way to train us mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes for major um, components of Hajj and major components of any worship you missed it it, yeah. it can be m like made up made so up, you yeah. if you missed uh, Arafah day for, for instance and you've missed um, standing on Arafah it is not so it's not only required to answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you must answer the call of Allah at the appropriate time, at the right. time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala committed Because this do. means you answer it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to answer. Mm -hmm. You're not answering it as you want to answer it. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, I'm going to finish um, this job and then I'm going to go whenever I yeah. I'm done. Uh, when I have a free time, I'll go and do it. Yeah. Uh, this is this is not how it works. If you want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should be, you should first of all humiliate yourself to your creator and then you should uh, obey it, obey the commandments, and answer the calls as the, the, the your creator has has given mm -hmm. it to you. So exactly, you just said the uh, it's so important to be humble and to have this humility uh, when we're dealing with uh, the commandments of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Of course, but uh, sometimes we fall into the trap of the shaitan, and, and we actually challenge the commands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, you know, it's one thing it's one thing to say, okay, you know. I, I'm doing something bad and uh, and I'm not following the commands of Allah but at least you know you're just leaving it at that other people they actually challenge the commands of Allah I'll give you an example there there's a uh, you know some some anti-muslim woman uh, she came out uh, I believe yesterday or the day before and she said uh, that uh, slaughtering animals yeah, during the time I of Hajj, heard of it. yeah you know is is, uh, is the biggest massacre that happens <laughs> Every single year. Well, isn't that a form of uh, you know not following the commandments of Allah? Of course it is, and I'm sorry to say, uh, some people are just um, like they're too attractive, and they're too of like offending. Uh, they're offensive to others mm -hmm. and offensive to Islam to to the extent that they forgive other massacres. There are lots of other ma massacres against humanity, not not any other thing that happens and they're not actually spoiling it mm -hmm. so they come to Islam like oh this is the h biggest massacres, massacre that happens every year and then we we as Muslims we answer the call of Allah and we find and see the purpose of every living being as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has have given it the purpose mm -hmm. so if we have given if we have we're guided that ch cheap camels uh, water buffaloes and cows are to be slaughtered and eaten and this is a right, uh, an Islamic right I believe those creatures are, are, are created for this purpose mm -hmm. and also 
we would say that Islam is, uh, has been teaching, the Islamic teachings is always about mercy, even in sla slaughtering animals. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is like Muslims, when they slaughter, this is a right that they doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and animals from, I think, from Islamic view and from also all Ab Abrahamic faith and even normal faith that they're uh, created to benefit human kinds, mm -hmm. like all, everything on the world and on earth are being created to serve human kinds. Uh, we have just uh, one final minute here in the sure. segment. Uh, so if you can please uh, share your final thoughts with our brothers and sisters and your final advice of how to answer the call of Allah. I would say answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to do it. We, I would keep myself with a, with a righteous uh, company. This is That's very important. This is, I think, one of the best ways to do it. When I'm kind of lazy and I have my friends and company with me is like Yusuf come on let's 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 push let's do let's do like perform our praise and it's like Alhamdulillah this is a blessing mm -hmm. uh, and also I want to share the last thought about tomorrow and confirm uh, t tomorrow as um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it to accept from all of us Amen. and I ask all brothers and sisters to to have this fasting and o not only the fasting from food and drink but also the spiritual fasting from all sins and let's let's have it as a as a fresh start for our muslim spiritual lives and i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to have this uh karma that is happening throughout the islamic uh part of the world uh, i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on on eid days to to have this mercy upon our brothers and sisters throughout all uh, part of the world mm -hmm. within Gaza, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, all Islamic st uh, and Muslim countries. And let's not forget those people and those Muslims who are not really going to enjoy Eid as we do. Let's just at least pray for them and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant the Islamic nation mm -hmm. and the Ummah uh, the the greatness of Islam mm. and the applying of Islam in mm. our lives, which have and have the Islamic civilization revived. Barakallah feek, Brother Yusuf. It's always a pleasure talking with you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Jazakallah khair. My dear brothers and sisters, we are not done here yet tonight. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, inshallah, we'll give you some health tips as many people, inshallah, will be fasting tomorrow. Hopefully as many of us as possible, inshallah. We'll be back in just a minute. Imam al Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, have indeed uh, did a great and a tremendous job in compiling some of the most beautiful ahadith and relevant ayat in one of his marvelous works, which is known as Riyad al Salihin or Gardens of the Pious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all amongst the dwellers of Gardens of the Pious. Jannat al Naim. Allahumma ameen.
Let's start from where they started. Who are they? The companions of the Prophet ﷺ. When they started learning the religion of Islam, they started with the aqidah, the belief system, faith. Brothers and sisters in Islam, dear viewers, the Prophet ﷺ spent 13 years in Mecca teaching that generation the belief system, the aqidah. Aisha radiallahu anha confirms this by saying the first things which were revealed from the Quran was matters of aqidah. Who is Allah? Jannah, paradise and hell. Jundub ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, may Allah be pleased with him, said we learned the belief system, we learned al-Iman, we learned the aqidah, then we learned the Quran, then we then learned, learned, learned the Quran. The Quran. Brothers and sisters in Islam, nowadays, a lot of our cultural practices, a lot of our societal norms are against our belief system. And the reason why we're falling into this, because we did not start from where they started. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Welcome back to the final segment here tonight of our program, Hajj Day Today, a very special episode on the eve of Arafah Day. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, tomorrow is the big day for the Hujjaj and also a very big day for us as we're going to be fasting here, inshaAllah. So we have some uh, great medical advice for you. Uh, for both our brothers and sisters who are at Hajj, if they are watching us right now from Mina, or for those of us also who are going to be fasting from their homes, inshaAllah. So I'm really, really honored to be joined here in the studio by Dr. Ahmed Ashalqawi, who is a neurosurgeon. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa sahibah. Thank you so much, doctor, for taking the time to be with us and enlighten us. And thank you for your invitation to be with you today. I appreciate it. Um, now, if we can first address our brothers and sisters uh, at Hajj, and uh, let me begin by asking you, what are some of the most common problems uh, that otherwise healthy people uh, you know, could face during Hajj? Yes. First, I'd like to congratulate all Muslim people all over the world for the Adha feast. Alhamdulillah. Uh, my deep uh, wishes for all pilgrims uh, today standing on Arafah. And my uh, deep wishes uh, for, for them, for uh, them the, the I wish for them, uh, best health and safety mm -hmm. tomorrow on standing on Arafa. Mm -hmm. um, the common medical health problems which occur during Hajj are categorized into main uh, into m more than one group. Uh, first, uh, age-related uh, factors mm -hmm. like uh, exhaustion, uh, fractures uh, during crowding. Uh, also, um, during stampede, uh, there is another group which uh, is uh, heat-related, mm -hmm. like heat uh, strokes. Heat strokes. Yeah. Yes, heat exhaustion, heat strokes, sun burns from uh, prolonged exposure for sun mm -hmm. uh, during the day. Also, there is um, another group which uh, we can uh, classify it as uh, infection, infectious mm -hmm. uh, diseases like uh, respiratory tract infections, mm -hmm. uh, meningitis, uh, which occurs in more than one outbreak uh, the previous years. Mm -hmm. Um, also, the pilgrims may suffer from cardiovascular uh, problems like uh, angina, mm -hmm. uh, chest pain, uh, difficult breathing from um, under or uh, inadequate ventilation. Uh, and many people which have uh, brain insults or brain problems may have flaring up of their conditions mm -hmm. during uh, crowding uh, uh, times. Mm. Uh, but the most common uh, uh, problem which occur for 
fell during uh, during Hajj uh, is due to sun exposure. Great. Yeah. Inshallah, we're going to actually take uh, all of these things that you just mentioned and go into them a little bit specifically. But I want to begin with the infectious uh, yeah. diseases. Uh, because really that's a very hot topic uh, this year, last year, and almost every year. Yes. Uh, because as you said, you know, there are so many people and they're coming from all different parts of the world. Uh, and, and uh, you know, some people may be carrying uh, some sort of a bacteria or a virus or things like that. You mentioned meningitis. Yes. And uh, that is a common word or a common disease that we often hear of, but we may not know, know too much about it. So if we can begin uh, by definition of what meningitis is, it would be appreciated. Yes. Uh, meningitis means um, inflammation of the meninges. What are the meninges? The meninges are the membranes which cover the brain uh, and protects it against infection, mm -hmm. uh, trauma, uh, shocks. Uh, under these meninges, um, there is uh, watery fluid, which is the CSF. Uh, this fluid uh, also protects the brain and provides nutrients for the brain. So uh, uh, meningitis means inflammation at this site uh, in, in the meninges. How uh, can meningitis occur? Uh, meningitis it is infection caused by microbe. This microbe um, most often uh, uh, transferred from one, peop one person to another through the air. Mm -hmm. Droplet infection, especially in during these times, uh, there is m a lot of people uh, each year, more than four million people in narrow place. So droplet infection uh, or airborne infection is easy to occur. Uh, the organism is, is, trans is transmitted from one person to the, other, as to the, an to the other through the air, uh, uh, stuck to the muco mucous membrane or the membrane lining the nose. Mm -hmm. From it, it, it creeps with, uh, through the bloodstream till it reaches the meninges. Okay. Uh, when it reaches the meninges, produces inflammatory response, inflammatory mm -hmm. uh, cascade in mm -hmm. the, these membranes. Uh, and uh, the, these membranes the swells, uh, and the swelling of these membranes is the cause of the most symptoms which occur for the patient with meningitis. And that's my next question actually is about symptoms. And we have some images, inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, that we're going to be showing you in uh, just a moment relating to uh, the symptoms of meningitis. Um, what are some of the most uh, common uh, symptoms of meningitis? Uh, the patient with meningitis first uh, complain from uh, mild influenza-like symptoms which can pass unnoticed, uh, then followed uh, by after a few hours by uh, the full blown picture of meningitis, which is, uh, which is uh, headache. Mm -hmm. The patient complained from headache. Uh, are, we talking, are we talking about like a very severe headache yes. or just a regular headache? No, this, there is a, a, a very, very severe headache. Uh, like you can't, bear, like you can't bear it, right? Yeah, you, can't, yeah. you, you cannot deal with the headache. Yeah, like yeah. It, it's a very, very bad headache, right? Yes, uh, described mm. by the patient as the worst headache of my life. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't have uh, someone like it before. Mm. Uh, associated with uh, stiff neck, the patient cannot flex or move his neck without mm -hmm. uh, pain. Mm -hmm. uh, nausea, mm -hmm. uh, vomiting, uh, fever, with any infection may cause fever in, mm -hmm. th in the body uh, for the patient. Uh, also, uh, the patient m may deteriorate until uh, he has convulsions and uh, may lose concentration mm -hmm. uh, by time. Uh, so if any patient uh, has this uh, warning signs or warning symptoms, should also uh, suspect it to have meningitis and mm -hmm. should ask for medical care immediately. As a neurosurgeon, how do you uh, diagnose this disease? Uh, a, a diagnosis is uh, first we, we should uh, clinically suspect the patient from these symptoms. Mm -hmm. When the patient is suspected to have meningitis, we, we should confirm our suspicion by... Uh, Medical tests, blood yes, work? Yes, by, by, by uh, tests uh, like uh, complete blood count, mm -hmm. CBC. Uh, there is some changes which occur in the CBC from which we can suspect meningitis. Uh, comp CT, uh, it is one, uh, some mm -hmm. sort of imaging. Uh, 
to confirm to sure surely diagnose meningitis uh, we should take uh, um, a little amount of this fluid which which covers which pass around the brain uh, through what we call lumbar puncture which mm -hmm. is drainage of some CSF through the back of the mm -hmm. patient and uh, analyze this uh, this fluid and uh, 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 if there is certain changes in this fluid like increased uh, in the white blood cells uh, we can examine uh, this fluid for bacteria or pathogen or microbes which cause the, mening the meningitis mm. Uh, through these tests, we can confirm and surely diagnose that the patient has uh, meningitis. Hmm. Um, how do you treat it? Are we talking really uh, ab about a disease that's easy to treat, or is it difficult, or uh, is there really no cure for it? Yes, uh, uh, it is easy to treat, but uh, uh, before uh, we treat it, we should know how to prevent uh, this, uh, this problem. Uh, people or uh, pillage rooms in crowded places should uh, uh, should sit in w uh, well uh, adequately ventilated areas. Mm -hmm. Should avoid uh, close contact uh, to each other. Um, should avoid uh, a towel or sharing like toothbrushes, uh, towels, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, also, m people, especially which wh who are at high risk for uh, having infection, should uh, uh, take care uh, from uh, close contact to each other mm -hmm. or close contact to uh, non patients who have meningitis. Uh, then, uh, 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 treatment uh, include uh, first uh, 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 drugs like antibiotics, uh, antipyretics, which the drugs which decrease the body temperature, mm -hmm. corticosteroids, uh, cortisone uh, has a great role to avoid complications from uh, meningitis for the patient. Uh, and uh, try to isolate the patient, not to infect uh, surrounding people. Mm -hmm. Um, IV fluids, sh we should give him IV fluids. Mm -hmm. All these uh, uh, procedures should be in uh, adequately equipped uh, place like uh, hospital uh, uh, or medical center which uh, can deal with uh, this uh, medical problem. Uh, approximately how long does it take for this uh, treatment process? Uh, treatment is very easy, especially if the meningitis is caused by virus, not uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. Virus, in general, uh, has a self-limiting uh, is a self-limiting disease. Mm -hmm. Just supportive uh, measures like IV fluids, uh, antibiotics, and the disease will uh, will 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 uh, wear itself out. Will, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, um, in general, um, most cases take from three to five days uh, to completely recover and uh, uh, can uh, do uh, their daily work. Yeah. We talked uh, about some of the infectious diseases that a person can face at Hajj. Uh, now let's, uh, let's try to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, problems that a person can face. As you said, uh, heat stroke or heat exhaustion yes. uh, is, is really a big problem, especially uh, you know, at this time of the year. It is still very hot uh, in yes. uh, the Mecca area. Yes. So, uh, you know, what causes uh, heat stroke when we're there? Is it just, you know, direct uh, contact with the sun or yeah. is it being there for an extended time? Uh, the most common cause of heat stroke is prolonged uh, sun exposure, mm -hmm. especially in uh, patient extremes of age. The, the body tries to uh, control its temperature uh, through uh, a, a one center, important area in the brain called the heat regulatory center. This area uh, decrease uh, body temperature when it rises by uh, sweating, uh, producing sweat. Uh, this sweat, when evaporates, it take off uh, the excess heat from the, mm -hmm. uh, the body. Uh, other method uh, of uh, flowing temperature is vasodilation of the blood vessels, uh, especially under the skin, uh, to uh, to get rid from the this temperature. Mm -hmm. So, if uh, the rate of heat production is much more than 
the 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 release of yeah, the yes yeah, the, the loss of temperature will be uh, by the heat regulatory center mm -hmm. it will the, the body temperature will rises and will produce the symptoms which uh, characterize uh, uh, heat exhaustion a heat stroke mm. uh, these symptoms the patient can uh, suffer from uh, headache mm. the body temperature is high but uh, before is the patients reach the, the, the stage of heat, egg, uh, heat stroke, uh, the body uh, produce more, a lot of sweat mm -hmm. to try to keep. Uh, try to keep up, you know, try to yes. cool off uh, yes. the body. Try to cool off. We have some pictures uh, actually of, of the symptoms uh, that are we're going to be showing on the screen in just a moment, uh, inshallah. Uh, there they are. Uh, if you can, uh, you know, tell us what they are. Uh, briefly uh, you should be seeing them uh, brothers if we can have them on our screens there we go yeah uh, yeah if you can just look uh, anywhere around you and uh, yes, check them out this, this figure uh, illustrates uh, the most common symptoms which occur in heat uh, stroke mm -hmm. um, starting from the head the patient suffer from headache uh, lack of concentration uh, rapid shallow breath the patient can have difficulty in breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, the body temperature is uh, more than 38 uh, degrees centigrade. 38 degrees. Mm. Yes. And the pulse is uh, full and bounding mm. and, uh, and rapid. The patient has rapid pulse. He feels his, his heart beats. He's beating strong. very fast, yeah. Yes. Uh, also, um, there may be cramps, especially in the muscles, which mm -hmm. uh, expose to... Uh, uh, stress by exercise like mm -hmm. uh, calf muscles, abdominal uh, wall muscles. Uh, the patient uh, may have dark urine, that means that uh, he is very dehydrated mm -hmm. and should. He's losing water. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, now, how does this happen all of a sudden or does it take like minutes or does it take hours? Uh, you know what I mean? Yes. Or does it just happen uh, at one moment? Like, because what we see. As regular people, as we see a person standing there, the uh -huh. next moment he's down, yes. right? Yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that it's, it's kind of a longer process. Uh, it is a longer process, and the patient is, is also all the time is trying to cool the body, uh, its body uh, mm. down. Uh, when the, the, the weather is very hot and there is a lot of humidity, the body cannot get rid from its uh, temperature till it reach critical level, which after that, we, he, he, it, it cannot uh, withstand excess heat. Uh, the patient immediately or st uh, rapidly uh, feels uh, severe headache, uh, cramps, uh, may feel down on the ground due to lack of con uh, consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, may have convulsions in severe cases. Uh, so uh, there is some precautions which we should uh, give uh, it to for all pilgrims not to stand uh, a long of a lot of time uh, under s uh, direct, the direct sun, sun. rays mm -hmm. he should stay uh, in, in, in a, a, a little shade uh, he should uh, drink a lot of waters uh, the, the patient also uh, should try to keep its body uh, all the time wet uh, to decrease the body temperature. Mm. Uh, he should use umbrellas uh, during uh, 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 walking mm -hmm. or uh, the rituals. Uh, he should uh, also uh, patients uh, 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 who are, uh, are at high risk uh, for having uh, uh, heat stroke should also take care not to stand a lot of time mm. and uh, spend a lot of time in direct sun exposure. Mm. Uh, and if the patient is starts to complain from these symptoms which uh, mentioned before, uh, he should uh, uh, rapidly ask for medical uh, help. Uh, he should uh Thank you so much. Uh, uh, alhamdulillah, I think we gave uh, some very good advice to our brothers and sisters who are at Hajj. But we only have one minute left in the program, and I don't want to leave out uh, those of us who are not at Hajj uh, this year without any advice. So uh, my final question is relating to, uh, alhamdulillah, Rabbi, I mean, uh, many of our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world who are going to be fasting tomorrow, inshallah, of course, those who are not at Hajj, uh, many of them, uh, you know, face uh, and they, have, they suffer from severe headaches. 
when yes. they are uh, uh, fasting. Uh, tell us how we can try to limit that or avoid it altogether. Uh, people or Belgians tomorrow uh, should uh, avoid strenuous exercise, avoid uh, much walking, uh, the direct sun exposure. Uh, before fasting, they should uh, drink a lot of water. Uh, you, thought you mean those of us who are fasting uh, tomorrow here, you know, like not, not those are Hajj, yes. but those of us are fasting here, yes. drinking a lot of water. Y okay. Yes, you, you should drink a lot of water, mm. uh, keep the, uh, their body all, uh, all the time uh, dry mm -hmm. and wet. Uh, to, uh, keep, uh, keep it wet. So uh, in Suhoor, uh, we should try our best to drink as much water as, as yeah, we can. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they should avoid uh, uh, crowding, uh, avoid uh, direct uh, heat uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, also, they, uh, uh, they uh, should uh, stay in uh, well-ventilated places. Mm -hmm to avoid the infection or and as you said it's not just about uh, you know it's not just about the heat it's also about the humidity yes uh, those are kind of like two killer factors uh, yes. together yes great. humidity m m makes the problems more uh, great because uh, it prevents sweat from evaporation mm -hmm. and uh, keeps the temperature inside the body the body cannot get rid from excess mm -hmm. temperature Speaking of great, uh, I want to thank you so much for all the great advice that you gave us here uh, this evening. Thank Unfortunately, you. we've uh, run out of time in this uh, short segment, but we've definitely learned a lot from you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Thank, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, thank you for having been with us here this evening. Inshallah, we will be back with you tomorrow. Tomorrow is the big day for all our brothers and sisters who are going to be on the mountain of Arafat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from them more than two and a half million Muslims, more than two and a half million Muslims from every single part of the globe are going to be standing in one place together asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from them inshallah. And also tomorrow is a big day for all of us who are not going to be at Hajj because it's a day of fasting so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive our sins as well a year in advance and a year in the past. And at the same time, it's a big day here at Huda TV because it is our biggest day of the year with live coverage. We'll be with you for more than 12 hours of live coverage tomorrow, inshallah, maybe even 15 hours, who knows, all the way from the early morning hours when our brothers and sisters start heading out to Arafat. And inshallah, we will be going all the way till nighttime when they head out of Arafat and to Muzdalifah, inshallah. Until tomorrow morning, not tomorrow night, inshallah, we leave you in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have a good night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.